next talk is uh, by Dick Fisher, and the title is The Search for the Historical Adam Revisited. Uh, show and tell, I put a, a tablet around that you all can take a look at. I think I'll get a chance to see what it looks like. If anybody can read Sumerian, there you are. You can tell us what it says. I had thought that my article 30 years ago would bring some awareness to this issue, but it didn't stop pure speculation. And here's, a, here's a case in point, if I can uh, make it work. Ah. <clears throat> this book was published in 2013 with four authors, and four of them were ASA members, by the way. And here are some quotes. Dennis Lamoureux said, I do not believe there ever was ever a historical Adam. William Barrick said, in my view, Adam is the originating head of the entire human race. John Collins said, I argued that the best way to account for the biblical presentation of human life is to understand that Adam and Eve were real persons at the headwaters of humankind. Now, John Walton, in another book, he's the fourth author for this book that I just showed you, but in another book, he ventured beyond his level of expertise in my estimation, and here's what he said. In my view, Adam and Eve were real people in a real past. They were individual persons who existed in history. I totally agree. But he went on to say, the Hebrew designation Adam is a literary designation given relatively late. We cannot think of it as the actual personal name of this historical person. And here's where he and I totally disagree. William Lane Craig post published about two years ago, and this is what he said. The entire Bible considers Adam the historical progenitor of the human race a position that must therefore be accepted as a premise for Christians who take seriously the inspired truth of Scripture. This comes from his webpage. Working from that foundation of biblical truth, Craig embarks upon an interdisciplinary survey of scientific evidence to determine where Adam could be most plausibly located in the evolutionary history of humankind ultimately determining that Adam lived between 750,000 and a million years ago as a member of the archaic human species, Homo heidelbergensis. Well, here's a lineup. Choose your originator. You probably recognize heidelbergensis in the middle of the top row who lived between 300,000 and 600,000 years ago, not a million. To his right is Homo erectus, who is also a candidate under consideration by some paleoanthropologists. But none of these fellows is at the headwaters of humankind. The beginning of our genus at the Great Divide in human history lived roughly six million years ago. So I would like to nominate this fellow here. So Anthropus Chidentius, not as Adam, but as a forerunner to whom we could all be related. And I can see you all looking at your neighbors now to see the similarities. <laughs> this is from the Smithsonian Institute. Comparison of Neanderthal and human, modern human DNA suggests that the two lineages diverge from a common ancestor, most likely Heidelbergensis, sometime between 350,000 and 400,000 years ago, with the European branch leading to H. Neanderthalus and the African branch to Homo sapiens. They went on to say both fossil and genetic evidence strongly supports an African origin for humans about 200,000 years ago. The earliest dates for modern human fossils outside of Africa are almost 100,000 years earlier. So I would just suggest this would be the type of scientific evidence that Craig could have used before he published in the Smithsonian would have been a good place to look and where I was a docent for seven years. This comes from Alex, uh, Alistair McGrath. This is a required reading and I had to read this when I went through seminary. The textbook Christian Theology and Introduction authored by Alistair McGrath 
is required reading for many theological students. Detailed in the book is the strategy commonly employed through which the meanings of scripture can be wrung out of the inspired text, tradition, reason, and personal experience. Through these long established tools, theologians can produce the same negligible results that has hamstrung theology for hundreds of years. As science soars unimpeded by 17th century thinking, theology remains unfazed by intellectual progress. What did Origen think about it, or Augustine? What did early Christian writers know about the history of the ancient Near East that has come to light only within the last 170 years? If scientists have any hopes of influencing theology, it will come through teaching the benefits of using data and evidence that scientists typically employ. Looking for Adam? Using biblical evidence combined with historical evidence, we can pinpoint Adam living in Mesopotamia no earlier than 7,000 years ago, and as the forerunner of the Semitic peoples, Adamites, Semites, Israelites, Arabs, and Jews. Genesis 2 to 11 is an abbreviated history of the beginning of the Semites. It is not human history. Genesis tells us where the Garden of Eden was located. Now, I've retranslated this slightly so it makes better sense than if you read it right out of the King James Version. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the land, and Adam, Hebrew Adam, was not there to till the ground, but there went up a fountain from the land and watered the whole face of the ground. Well, this is what they called a fountain. We would probably call it a water wheel. What they used it for was to divert water off of the rivers into their irrigation canals. And these were, were broken up during the flood. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from thence it was parted and became into four heads. Now, what they did, if you see the blue line, they diverted water off of the Euphrates down through an old riverbed where the Euphrates had flowed in millennia past. And it watered Eridu. It watered this, the village of Ubaid, Sumerian Ur, and the garden. Well, that's four. Maybe that's what they're talking about. But it may not be, because there are four rivers here. The Pishon, the Gihon, the Hydekel, and the Euphrates, I have in blue. And then Havilah and Cush and Assyria, which are the lands, all are adjacent to the garden. There's the rivers. If, uh, if you look at the far left to the bottom, you see what is now dubbed the Kuwait River. It no longer flows, but this likely is the Pishon. In fact, it's been identified as the Pishon, which flows out of Saudi Arabia, where there is gold, bdellium, onyx stone, just as described in Genesis. If you look to the top right, you see the Karkay joined by the Kashkan that comes out of an area called Khuzistan to this very day, out of Iran. Then, of course, you have the Euphrates and the Tigris. In the lands, Saudi Arabia has been identified as Havilah, Khuzistan, I just mentioned, and then Assyria would be just to the north. So this is the area where we should look if we're going to find our original people, Adam and Eve. Genesis tells us when the Garden of Eden existed. Now, even before the flood, we had farming, tents, cattle, harp and organ, brass and iron. Now, this is not the old Stone Age. This is emblematic of the Neolithic period, which is no earlier than 10,000 years ago. And Cush begat Nimrod, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Iraq and Akkad. We're going to talk about the Akkadians. And in the land of Shinar, which is their word for Sumer. And here they are on the map. The Akkadians, as you can see, are concentrated a little bit to the northwest, and the Sumerians more to the southeast. There was constant contact between them, but as you can see, they're different morphologically, as well as they spoke a different language. So they, they were two distinctly different cultures living in the same environment. When kingship was lowered from heaven, it was in Eridu, according to the Sumerian king list. Babylonian tradition places the Garden of Eden near Eridu, says Archibald Sace. 
At that time, Adapa, the son of Iridu, it says in the legend of Adapa. So if I was going to look for someplace close to the garden, that's where I would look. And here it is on the map. The Iraqi government excavated Iridu 1948-49. Archaeologists dated the bottom layer at 4800 BC. After digging through 16 layers of temples down to virgin soil, they discovered a tiny temple with an altar. On top of the altar were found traces of burnt offerings. And here's a picture of it here. I paid $3,000 to the Illustrated London News just for permission to look at this picture. So you all get your, time, get your money's worth. <laughs> but you can see right there the altar where the, the burnt offerings were, were, were discovered after it was excavated. Pottery fragments discovered at the bottom at Iridu were identified as Ubaid with an unidentified pottery they called Iridu ware. This new pottery style may be indicative of a special pair of Adamites that moved in, people we would call mm, Adam and Eve. This is an example of uh, Ubaid ware, and this is an example of what they call Iridu ware. And you can see the difference in pottery style. So we have two different peoples living at the very bottom on, virg at, at the virgin, uh, on virgin soil. When Eve was tempted and Adam disobeyed, they relocated to Iridu, a Ubaidan settlement. The covenant couple had two children initially, Cain and Abel. Cain murders his brother and departs for the land of Nod. Now, I don't know any theologian that has ever figured out where the land of Nod is located. However, Genesis goes on to say, Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. Well, we do know where that is. It's right here on the map. Today it's called Warka. Before that it was called Uruk. And before that it was called Enoch, or in Sumerian, Unag. All Cain had to do was shinny up the Puritan Iridu Canal by boat or overland from Iridu, where he moved in with a bunch of Ubadans, and that's where he probably found his wife. Anne Makar, and I, I put that Anne in, in red because that means king. In both Sumerian and Akkadian, the E-N prefix means king. So that would be King Makar. We built the city of Enoch after the flood. These are his words from his treatise, Anne Makar and the Lord of Arata. City, majestic bull, bearing vigor and great awesome splendor. The twin city. Enoch goes on to say, Enoch, the twin city. Enoch, the twin city. Brick built twin city. What is he talking about? Well, after the first two kings, Alulam and Alagar, ruled at Iridu, it says in the Sumerian king list, Iridu was smitten with weapons. Kingship was carried to Batabira. Here it is on the map, a Sumerian settlement, and they warred upon their Akkadian neighbors. According to the Sumerian king list, Iridu fell, and kingship passed to the victorious Batabirans. The Adamite population at Iridu either was called out by God prior to the battle, or left as a result of the battle. They took the same route Cain did, seeking safety near relatives, and settled in what became Arek, or Uruk, in Sumeria. Now, they were kings in their twin cities. We know that because they got the prefix. E-N means king. So we have two people living, one in the city of Enoch, and the twin city, just like... Um, uh, what is Twin Cities up in uh, Wisconsin? Minneapolis, Minneapolis and St. Paul. Twin Cities, okay. And we have Cain's people living in uh, the city of Enoch, and then Seth's folks in the, in the city of Enosh, side by side with their cousins. Now, you can see the similarity in names, and theologians have struggled for centuries trying to figure out why is there a similarity in the names of the descendants? Well, it's because they were closely related and lived in twin cities. Historical Adam. I'm going to start in Egypt, and you'll see why in a minute. Egyptian creation myths are accounts of the creation of the world. 
Ancient Egyptians had many creator gods and legends. The world, or more specifically Egypt, was created in diverse ways in different parts of the country. In Memphite theology, Ta, the high god of Memphis, was master of destiny and creator of the world. The agent of Ta's will, who carried out his commands, was called Atom. The pyramids of Menare and Nefekare were inscribed as a dedication, dating to about 2400 BC, which would be centuries before Abraham. A first creation arose on a primeval hill out of the waters of chaos. The one who was created was called Atom, and among those whom Atom begot was called Seth. Sound familiar? Now, back to Mesopotamia. The Akkadian legend of Adapa. Adapa was a priest living in Eridu who had a fishing accident and in anger broke the wing of the south wind and thus had to report to Anu, the father god in heaven. The god Ea counsels Adapa to get him past the guards and tells him he would be offered the food and water of death, which he must refuse. Instead, he is offered eternal life, which he dutifully refuses and returns to earth. This is part of the legend. He does baking with the bakers of Eridu. He does the food and water of Eridu every day. Sets up the offerings table with his pure hands. Without him, the offerings table is cleared away. Where's the offerings table? Right here. That's the offerings table where he set up. And that was Adapa, and I will tell you, that was Adam. So, to me, this is the holy grail of the Old Testament. Anu called out to his vizier, Why hasn't the south wind blown towards the land for seven days? His vizier answered him, My lord, Adapa, the son of Ea. If you look at 338, the son of Adam, which was the son of God. The parallel is the same. Adapa is the son of the god Ea, and Adam is the son of God. This is part of what Adapa fragment, what ill he has brought upon mankind and the disease that he brought upon the bodies of men. I have no idea what that's about. <laughs> the legend of Adapa contains at least 12 commonalities with Adam of Genesis. Adapa placed at Eridu and Babylonian tradition places the Garden of Eden near Eridu. Adapa, a priest, was neither god nor king, and that's absolutely, totally unique in Mesopotamian literature. They didn't write about priests. Adapa was created by Ea, God, and Adam was created in the image of God. Adapa was a baker, and Adam told he would eat bread. Adapa described a seer, claimless, clean of hands, anointer, observer walls of laws. This would be descriptive of Adam. Adapa broke the wing of the south wind, and Adam was given dominion. Adapa brought ill upon mankind, and through one man, sin entered the world. Adapa spoke with Anu, the father god, and Adam talked with God. Adapa and Adam both called to account for bad behavior. Adapa was offered the food and water of eternal life, and Adam was cut off from the tree of life. Adapa was clothed by his father God, and Adam was clothed by God. Adapa told to return to earth, and Adam told he would return to dust. Are they the same people? Fragments of the Adapa legend were in the library of Ashurbanipal at Nineveh. One was found among the Amarna tablets in the Egyptian archives of Anathanas the third and fourth, dated to the 14th century BC. Six fragments of the Adapa legend have been recovered, written in various Semitic languages. Versions and fragments have been found in Akkadian, Canaanitish Babylonian, Assyrian, and Amorite. Of note is that versions are recorded in languages tied to tribes on different branches of Noah's family tree. Who would have been important enough or so well known that descendants of both Ham and Shem would have written about him for many generations? This is Sennacherib, and you can read about him. He was king of Assyria, and you can read about him in 2 Chronicles, 2 Kings, and Isaiah. Sennacherib, king of Assyria, said Adapa, Ea gave Adapa vast intelligence. Sennacherib compared his own accomplishments in conceiving the ground plan of his palace and city with that of Adapa, who received his wisdom from his father, the wise Ea. King Ashurbanipal recalled a dream where his distant ancestor Asher spoke to him, saying, O king, lord of kings, offspring of the sage, that would have been Sennacherib, and Adapa. 
you surpass in knowledge even the Apsu and all the wise men. The Assyrian king traces ancestry through his grandfather to Asher and Adapa. This puts Adapa first in the Assyrian line of descent, as according to legend he had no earthly father. In 1906, Archibald Sace argued that Adapa should have been translated Adamu. He recommended, henceforth, we must transcribe the name of the first man of Babylonian tradition, not Adapa, but Adamu. Charles Horn published The Legend of Adapa in 1917. He included in a footnote Adapa or perhaps Adamu. Adamu was the second king listed on the Assyrian king list. One of the governors in the Canaanite city of Abla was Adamu. Archaeologists found lists of the dead in graveyards in Mesopotamian cities. One popular name was Adamu. In tablets recovered in Tello, Adamu was recorded among the proper names. In records recovered in the Canaanite city of Ebla, one of the governors under, under Igris Halam, first Ebli king, was Adamu. A clay tablet was recovered at Korsabad in 3334. A list of Assyrian kings begins with 17 kings who lived in tents. Tudi is first, followed by Adamu. To honor their famous forefather, Semitic tribes preserved the name for many generations and hundreds of years enabling us to identify a family relationship. By contrast, Adamu is not found among those nations not related, Sumerians, Egyptians, Persians, etc. When the Akkadian words are carried into Hebrew, the nominative U is dropped. Thus, Akkadian Elu for God becomes El in Hebrew, meaning God. And dropping the U in Akkadian, Adamu becomes the Hebrew Adam. Questions? Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for inviting me because I sat with you at lunch and, um, or at brunch, I guess. And um, so I appreciate being here. But my question to you is if you could summarize the thrust of your argument or what you want us to walk away from, especially my assumption is the majority of people in this room just have the classic biblical understanding of Genesis, um, Adam being the first man. And from what I recall from a previous conversation with you, you suggest that Adam is not necessarily the, the first man regarding the human race. But do I understand the first man regarding the Jewish people? And is that the thrust of your argument? What I'm endeavoring to do is reestablish credibility in the early chapters of Genesis, which now are mistranslated as human history, when they should have been translated as, as his, the history of a certain people, the Semites, the Israelites, the Arabs, the Jews. It was their history. But in 1611, when they did the King James Version, they thought it was human history, and they translated it as if it was. And that's why you have all the mistakes, and that's why a lot of people don't believe that Genesis has any bearing. I believe Genesis is good history. Okay, I'm not saying every word is, is absolutely true as, as what we might have seen if we'd have been there. Okay, But it's so close, and it's the best thing we have. And I think that if we knew it as... Semitic history and appreciated it as Semitic history, it re would reestablish credibility and maybe we could get more people into the group. Yes, I, I was just wondering if you'd comment on uh, this is all after the invention of agriculture. I think these, these kingdoms, the fact that they were river civilizations is an indication of that. Could you comment on that? And also, uh, uh, what about interpreting Adam? <coughs> And the Garden of Eden story is uh, the transition from hunter-gatherers. Before agriculture, we were hunter-gatherers for millions of years. Uh, or, or hunter and, and, and one, I think one key, thing, one key part of the Genesis story is the, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, which is the basis of morality. So you can't have a civilization shown as this without a, a moral law, which was the knowledge of good and evil. Could you comment on both of those? I believe the moral law uh, pertains to the law given to Adam, and that is simply just be obedient, do what I tell you, and I'll take care of you. That's all that's required. 
And he couldn't do it. He couldn't be honest with God. And he could not fulfill. I believe he was the first type of Christ, okay? uh, created in the image of God as Christ is in the image of God. And that I don't believe that we inherit, and now this is controversial, I don't believe that we inherit the, the, the image of God by being born into the world. We have six million years of hominids. Are they all in the image of God? No. Adam was in the image of God. Now, if we're not, how do we get it? By conforming to the image of Christ, who is in the image of God, in my opinion. And that's probably not appreciated by everybody. <laughs> Dick is going to be around longer, right? You're gonna, you're... I'm not going to go anywhere. Right, and he's easy to find. <laughs> uh, so, if you have other comments, questions, it's great to talk to. I have a lot of experience. <laughs> uh, and he'll convince you of anything. Just give him a chance. Thank <laughs> you.